Today we want to continue in our series on 1 Peter. Next week we're going to have a guest speaker. It'll be Jonathan from the Mount Zion Assembly that meets here on Saturday nights. And then the following week we will conclude our study on 1 Peter by looking at chapter 5. But this whole series on 1 Peter has been about the topic of having a living hope in a world of suffering. When you look around the world, you can see that the world knows a lot about suffering. And when you look in this assembly and you think about some of the things that people have gone through in the recent weeks and months, we know about suffering. And Peter, when he writes to the church, Uh, In Asia Minor, the various churches that he mentions in verse 1 and 2 of the beginning of the book are living in a world of suffering. And he doesn't just say, I'm sorry, that's too bad. He gives them a living hope. And so today we want to conclude our, our, the section of 1 Peter that deals with Christian suffering. So before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you that in the midst of suffering, you are there. That you have called us as your children to suffer for Jesus' sake. And that is not something that we uh, relish or uh, look forward to, but... It is something that your son, Jesus, went through first for us. And as Peter says earlier in the book, that we have been called to follow in his footsteps. So I pray today as we look at your word in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 19, that we would be open to what you have to say to us, that your Holy Spirit would be moving in our hearts to hear what your word has to say to us and that we would respond in a way that pleases you. If there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, I pray that they would see that living the Christian life is the only path to victory and that you would move in their hearts and bring them to a place of confessing Jesus Christ as Lord. So cleanse my lips now to speak your truth, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. First Peter, not the whole book, but a big chunk of the book is about Christian suffering. Not the kind of suffering that happens when you're hammering a nail into the wall and you hit your thumb. That is suffering too, but that's not the kind of suffering that he wants to talk about. Peter spends a good chunk of the middle part of this book from chapter 3, verse 13, all the way through to the end of the passage we want to look at today, verse four, or chapter 4, verse 19. He wants to spend this long section talking about what it means to be a Christian and suffer specifically for being a Christian. So two weeks ago, we looked at what Peter had to say about Christian suffering from, verse, uh, from chapter 3, verses 13 to 22, where Peter talks about the value of Christian suffering. He said that it, bling, it brings blessing, that it brings opportunity, that it also follows the example of Jesus. Last week, we looked at the beginning part of chapter 4, where Peter continues to talk about Christian suffering, but he shifts his focus now to talk about arming yourselves and being prepared for Christian suffering, and that Christian suffering needs to be, you need to steel yourself for it with right thinking, how you think about the way you used to live, how you think about the way you live now, and how you think about the way you live now moving into the future. But today, Peter is going to talk to us 
about chapter 4, verses 12 to 19, and he's going to answer the question, how should I respond to suffering? Because when you think about this world, everything in our lives is geared towards avoiding suffering. As you know, several weeks ago, I started to have a sinus infection. And so I'd come to the front and I'd start the sermon and after about five or ten minutes, my voice was like that. People were giving me ricolas and molasses and honey and advice and all these things to solve it because when you're suffering, you want the suffering to end. And I'd go home and at night I'd cough and I'd think, oh, when is this going to be over? I'm so tired of this. And everything in life, advertising and um, just the way we want to live in the 21st century is let's all be as comfortable as possible in every way. And if I can be comfortable, then life is good and everything is fine. But then, if suffering comes, and Peter's going to talk specifically about Christian suffering, we begin to question and we think, why is God mad at me? What did I do wrong? I don't like this. And again, there's all kinds of suffering. But Peter is talking specifically about suffering for being a Christian. When you take a stand and say, I'm not going to lie at work. I'm not going to cheat on my taxes. I'm not going to do what the world says to do. And they're going to come back at me and they're going to laugh at me and they're going to criticize me. And some of you have come from countries where if you say you're a Christian, they will put you in jail. They will torture you. They will kidnap you. And you will have severe problems simply because you are a Christian. So how should I respond to suffering? Peter's going to give us three responses that we should have in these verses from verse 12 to verse 19. The first response that he wants us to have is he'll say, don't be surprised when you suffer as a Christian. Rejoice. Next, he's going to say, don't be ashamed when you suffer as a Christian. Glorify God. And lastly, he's going to say, don't be defeated when you suffer as a Christian. Continue to be faithful. So let's look at what Peter has to share with us in God's word. First, when it comes to Christian suffering, the first thing Peter tells us is don't be surprised by this suffering. Rejoice. You think, what's wrong with him? Why rejoice? That seems crazy. But if you look at verse 12, verse 12 says this. Beloved, he's trying to say this in the most loving way. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. <clears throat> Peter is saying suffering is going to come. If you are a Christian, you will suffer. And so the, the reason he tells us not to be surprised about this suffering is when you are not surprised, then you are ready for it. He's already talked in the previous section about having your mind right, about thinking the right way about suffering. And now he is saying, when suffering comes, because it will always come if you are a follower of Jesus, 
Not to the same degree for everyone, but it will come if you are truly a follower of Jesus. So when it comes, do not be surprised. Be ready. Be ready for it. Because as he says here in verse 12, the trial that you are experiencing has come upon you to test you. He's already mentioned this in the beginning of the book, in chapter 1, in verses 5 and 6 and 7, to talk about suffering and rejoicing in suffering. Because when we suffer as a Christian, it is a time where God refines us and makes us more like Jesus. The analogy that he uses in the beginning of the book is gold. How do you make gold pure? You put it in the fire, and when it's put in the fire, all of the dross, all of the garbage burns off. And what you are left with is pure unadulterated, valuable gold. And so the negative advice he gives us here is don't be surprised. It's not strange. It is not weird that as a Christian, you will suffer. That is not to be unexpected. And if God is using that suffering in your life to test you, He's using that to show that you are a faithful follower of his. In one of the commentaries I read, Sinclair Ferguson put it this way very simply. The only thing that shows that you can handle suffering is suffering. The only thing that shows that you can handle suffering is suffering. And so when God brings suffering into your life, don't be surprised. This is not abnormal. This is not strange. But this is done by God to refine us, to make us more like his son Jesus. So the negative part of the advice is don't be surprised But then in verse 13, he continues on by saying this. But rejoice. And we think, what is, is Peter a masochist? Does he want us to be happy when things are not going well, when we are suffering as a Christian? But notice what he says specifically. Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. When we suffer like Jesus, it shows that we really belong to him. If my life is smooth sailing and easy, how does the hymn put it about flowery beds of ease, where I can just float my way to heaven and everything will be just fine. Something is not right. If I am living my life for Jesus, if I am seeking to serve him in my home, in my workplace, in my neighborhood, with all the people that I come in contact with, I should experience blowback. I should experience rejection. I should experience suffering. And we don't rejoice in some sort of victimhood. Oh, I'm so lucky people don't like me. That's not what he, we are supposed to rejoice about. He says in verse 13, Rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings. Jesus suffered too. And he suffered because he was doing exactly what the Father had called him to do. So we rejoice not only in the fact that we 
are showing ourselves to be aligned with Jesus, that we're following in his footsteps in the suffering. But Peter reminds us, Jesus is not suffering anymore. Because he finishes verse 13 by saying that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So rejoicing in suffering is not about being a masochist. It's about saying, Jesus followed this pathway. And when I suffer as a Christian, I am being like Jesus. But one day, when Jesus comes back and his glory is revealed, I will be able to rejoice because I will be able to follow him into his glory as well. So suffering is going to come. And suffering is not something to surprise us, but it is something for which we are to rejoice because we're following in the footsteps of Jesus, both in his suffering and in his glory. Peter goes on in verse 14 to say, not only are we following the example of Jesus, but we are becoming the place in which God can dwell. He says in verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Why are you blessed? Because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Did you notice in our scripture reading today, it seemed a little hodgepodgey, jumping from Exodus to Chronicles to John and then to 1 Peter. But did you see the thing that tied all of those verses together? It was talking about the glory of God. That when Moses built the tabernacle, and God's presence came down in the form of a cloud, and no one could go into that temple because they weren't ready. They weren't purified. And then when Solomon builds the temple, and the temple is now stationed in Jerusalem, and God's glory fills the temple and the priests could not go in because it was too holy for them when God's presence was there. And then in John, when Jesus himself comes, John 1.14 literally says, when Jesus came and tabernacled with us and we beheld his glory. We saw the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And when God's glory was revealed to the people at that time, how did they respond? They killed him. He was full of grace and truth, and they killed him. And now, Peter is saying here that the spirit of the glory of God rests on you. It was in the tabernacle. It was in the temple. It was revealed most perfectly by Jesus. But now, God is using suffering in your life and in my life as a Christian to burn off all the dross and all the garbage because the Spirit of God and the Spirit of His Shekinah glory is resting on you. And that is why he is able to say back in chapter 2 that we are a royal priesthood and we have been dedicated by God to offer spiritual sacrifices to him because he 
is making us holy so that the Shekinah glory of God can rest on us. Talk about blessing. You are blessed when you suffer because God is making you ready for his glory and for his power to rest on you. So when you suffer as a Christian, don't be surprised. Rejoice. Moving on to verse 15, Peter's second command is, don't be ashamed, glorify God. Verse 15 says this, let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. In other words, he's saying to us, there's plenty of reasons to suffer for doing the wrong stuff. Now, hopefully, the Christians that he's writing to and Christians anywhere at any time aren't going to be murderers or thieves or evildoers. But what about meddlers? One of those people that likes to go in and stir things up. Hey, I've got something to tell you. Remember that person over there and what they were doing? Let's, let's talk about them. Let's gossip about them. And then somebody finds out that you're spreading these rumors and they come back and they get mad at you and the relationship with you is broken and you say, well, I'm just suffering for Jesus. I'm just suffering for Jesus. <laughs> Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or even as a meddler. Don't bring on yourself self-inflicted shame. But he goes on in verse 16 to say this, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, if you are suffering because you are living the way God wants you to live, not as a thief or an evildoer or a murderer or a meddler, but you are living a life to please God. Peter says, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. The world loves to what, or loves to try and shame us. You Christians, how can you think that Jesus is the only way? You should be ashamed of yourself. All these sincere people out here that believe other stuff, how can you believe that Jesus is the only way? You should be ashamed of yourself. Christians, how can you live in a lifestyle that pleases God? How can you say that this is right and this is wrong? How dare you? You should be ashamed of yourself. And you become isolated and you become persecuted because you are suffering as a Christian. But when the world says to you, you should be ashamed of yourself, God says, don't be ashamed. Glorify God in that name. A couple of examples of this from the New Testament. In Acts chapter 5, when the apostles are preaching about Jesus and that he rose from the dead and that he is the Messiah and the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, call them in and they say, stop doing this. And they said, mm, sorry, we can't. We're not. We're not going to stop. And so they meet together and they say, well, we'll just beat them for a bit and then we'll let them go. And so they beat them and they let them go. But do you know how verse 40 and 41 ends? It says that they beat the apostles and told them not to speak any more about Jesus. But after they beat them, and they left the council. 
Acts 5 says, they left the council rejoicing because they were worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. They were thrilled. I have never been beaten on my back. I have been spanked many times, but I have never been beaten on my back. But I really doubt that my response to being beaten as a follower of Jesus to say, thank you, Jesus, for letting me suffer for you. But that's exactly what the apostles did. And so now Peter, one of those apostles, says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Focus everyone's attention on who God is and what he has done. Paul, who was not there in Acts 5, but I'm sure was happy about what happened there, later in 1 Timothy chapter 1, talks about the fact that he is been, has been called by God to preach the gospel. And he is not ashamed of the gospel because he knows who he has believed and is persuaded that God will keep him until that day. So when the world is saying to you, you should be ashamed of yourself, your actual response should be to glorify God and to point people to Jesus and not be ashamed. Why? Why should I glorify God? Why should I not be ashamed? Peter tells us in verse 17 when he says this, for it is time... It is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. God's judgment begins with his people. I'm not talking about judgment for sin. Jesus has already paid the bill in full. But even in 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul talks about we all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. How did I live my life as a Christian? Did I live to please God? And when you look throughout the Old Testament even, long before Peter writes this, whenever God begins to bring judgment on his people in the Old Testament, he always starts with the temple or with the tabernacle where his holy presence is located. So for example, right at the end of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3 says this, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi, the priests who minister in the temple, and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Why does judgment have to begin with us? Because if we are going to be and are the place where the Spirit of God and His glory is resting on us, we have to be pure. We have to be right. We have to be ready for His presence to be in us so that we can be the light to the world. So judgment begins with believers. It begins with us. But the last part of verse 17, I always have trouble reading this verse. 
one of the reasons why I became a missionary is 1 Peter 4, 17. The first part of the verse says, For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. If God is building a spiritual house where we are going to be offering spiritual sacrifices to him, we need to be holy. And that is why suffering comes, so that we can be refined, so that the sacrifices we are offering are holy, and we are experiencing that judgment now. But now Peter goes on to say this. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God. If it is hard for us and God's judgment begins with us, what is going to happen to the person who never follows Jesus who doesn't know Jesus at all. Let's say I live to be a hundred. I became a Christian when I was 10 years old. If I suffer as a Christian every day for 90 years, and I don't suffer every day as a Christian, but let's say I did. Let's say from the moment I became a believer at 10 years old, Until the day I die at 100, 90 years I suffer for being a Christian. What happens next for me? I enter the presence of Jesus and I live with him and experience my glorious inheritance, undefiled and incorruptible forever and ever and ever and ever. But if I am not a believer and I live to be 200 years old and I enjoy a happy, carefree, from my perspective, life, doing whatever I want, getting involved in all sorts of craziness, doing whatever, and then I die, what is waiting for me? What is waiting for me? And that's the question that Peter is asking us. If it begins with us, this judgment, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? They will be lost and separated from God and punished forever. Peter goes on in verse 18 to quote from the Old Testament, a verse in Proverbs that says exactly the same thing. Verse 18 says this, If the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? If the righteous person, their experience is, is hard because they are following Jesus and they are experiencing suffering because they are a believer in Jesus. If the righteous person is scarcely saved, what is going to happen to the ungodly and the sinner? That's why Peter says, when you suffer for being a Christian, don't be ashamed Glorify God. The, chan- the, the opportunity that you and I have if we are followers of Jesus to suffer for him means we're going to have the eternal weight of glory on us forever. Forever. 
But if we don't know Jesus, we have the eternal weight of punishment and death and separation from God forever. That is why when we suffer, we shouldn't be ashamed, but we should glorify God because he is making us ready to experience eternity with him. Lastly, verse 19, Peter says, don't be defeated, be faithful. Suffering comes and we think that it is hard and it is difficult, but Peter has reminded us, you're following in the footsteps of Jesus. The glory of God is resting on you and the suffering is there to purify you. So don't give up. Don't quit. Don't turn your back on Jesus because suffering is in your life. Don't think that God has turned his back on you because he sees all the suffering that you are going through for him and he knows exactly what's going on in your life and he is not surprised and you shouldn't be surprised either. And so he concludes in verse 19 with these words, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. God is always faithful. We're going to sing in a minute, All my life you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Why? Because the creator God is a faithful God. The one who made the universe is in charge of the universe. And Jesus, the Messiah, is sitting at his right hand until all his enemies are put under his feet. When we are suffering according to God's will, God sees and knows and understands what we are going through. And he is asking us to trust him because he is the faithful creator God. And again, back in chapter 2, he has told us that's exactly what Jesus did when he was reviled. He didn't revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. God is both loving and just. And when you suffer for God and for his glory, he will take care of you. So how will you respond? How will you respond when suffering comes for being a Christian? The natural human response is to say, this is terrible. This is bad. I want to get out of this. I need to stop this. This is not what I want. But God is calling us to remember that the difficulties we experience as a Christian, for being a Christian, are there to refine us and purify us. They are there to make us more like Jesus. They are there to refine us and purify us so that we are more equipped and ready for service to God as that royal priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices. The difficulties are also refining us and purifying us to remind us of the greatest suffering, 
the suffering for those who do not follow Jesus. So when you encounter struggles in your life as a follower of Jesus, how do you act? Are you rejoicing? Are you glorifying God? Are you being faithful? When you are suffering as a Christian, who do you turn to? Do you turn to your faithful creator and entrust your soul to him? Or do you complain and wonder where God is and what he is doing? And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, I'll ask again, what is the outcome for you? If it is hard for those who are Christians, what will be the outcome for you? You can settle it today by putting your faith and trust in Jesus and giving your life to him and saying, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sin and I want to accept his forgiveness. I confess that I need him and I want to live for him so that I can know God's presence in my life, that I can live in a way that pleases him so that someday I will go and be with him forever. If that's your desire today, come and speak to Lloyd. Come and speak to me. Come and speak to Bob. Come and speak to um, Michael. Come and speak to our wives if you'd rather speak to a lady. But don't let today go by without remembering if it is hard for those who are believers to be saved, what is the outcome for the ungodly and the sinner? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that it is by the power of his resurrection that we can have new life in Jesus and that he has reserved for us an inheritance undefiled and incorruptible if we have put our faith and trust in him. But strange as it may sound, we thank you for suffering, Christian suffering as well, because it is refining us and purifying us like gold to make us suitable and ready to have the Spirit of God rest on us so that we can bring you glory, not only in this life, but for eternity. I pray that we would respond appropriately with joy, with glorification of you, and with faithfulness when we are suffering because that is what you have called us to do. And again, I pray for anyone here who doesn't know you today that today would be the day that they would receive that eternal inheritance and become a follower of Jesus for your glory. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.